All right, YouTube, it's time for more perception versus reality and a little bit more political analysis regarding the debates. Uh, I've now sparred with about a dozen different people telling me, indeed, uh, the online polls were rigged, usually by 4chan or uh, on Reddit or something like that. Uh, I, I'd like to point out that this only leaves a few possibilities as to how this could happen. If, if Clinton won the debate, you'd think that people... Uh, within any organic movement would reflect that in online polling. You'd expect if energy and fervor for Trump and Clinton are both roughly equivalent, the, the, the aggregated polls overall, all of which are scientific, by the way, so I'm assuming you're going to trust them if you're trusting the CNN snap poll, uh, show a dead heat race uh, with Clinton leading by maybe a point, uh, essentially a tied game. If that's the case, and if you would expect energy and thus potentially turnout to be the same on both sides, what you would most likely see is that if there's rigging of the polls through 4chan by Trump fans, there would also be rigging of the online polls by Clinton fans on sites that they use, Tumblr, uh, most of Reddit as opposed to a handful of subreddits there, uh, and a million other sort of avenues uh, through CTR certainly there is organized paid posting that goes on why would they not get involved wouldn't they have the technological literacy to do so and when thinking about this <clears throat> I think there are only a few scenarios in which what we actually saw which is that Trump was ahead in the online polls do, do you think for a moment that I believe that 90% of the average American population thinks that Trump won the last debate no I look at fortune, or I look at time, and I look at the much closer gap between them, with Trump up two or three points ahead of Clinton in people's opinion, and I say that makes sense. That does not look like a rigged result, as opposed to perhaps Drudge, as opposed to perhaps some of these other sites, the smaller sites especially with less people using them, showing him with 100,000 votes up. Uh, you know, by 30 points or some insane number like that. No, I don't trust those uh, for a moment, but I do trust those that are fairly close because it coincides uh, with the logical reality of what actually happened at the debate, which is that Trump did what he needed to do. He didn't look insane or evil. He did look incoherent, but if this was going to hurt him, especially with undecided voters, it already would have. And clearly it hasn't throughout the entire campaign. Everybody in the country already knows his speaking tone is rambling. Unless he's using a teleprompter, he rambles. And at the debates, he doesn't have a teleprompter. He doesn't have notes. We already know that. Nobody gives a damn. Nobody cares, by the way, about the fact that Hillary Clinton deleted a bunch of emails. Nobody cares about Trump's tax returns. When the media speaks of these things... Noting how they analyzed, for instance, before I get into the possibilities of why the polling is as it is, with the tax returns, you can criticize Trump for his response to being egged on about this by the moderator, which I thought funny because the moderator never asked Clinton anything roughly comparable. However, his response and the truth of whether people actually care about the issue are two totally different things. Yeah, his response on that was flubbed. Of course it was. He flubbed a half a dozen other things during the debate, too. He could have followed through more viciously with every line of attack. He could have made it ten times more effective. He chose not to do so, or he forgot to do so, or because he was rambling without a script to use, uh, he was unable to do so. So what? Nobody cares about the tax returns any more than they care about Hillary's emails. Undecided voters, if they cared, they already would have become decided voters because these have already been issues for months. Every single day, being liberal in Salon talk about Trump's tax returns. Every single day, Breitbart and The Blaze and Drudge talk about Hillary's emails or the Clinton Foundation. They've become non-issues. They've become old and boring. The fact that they were brought up at the debate was obviously going to happen. It doesn't matter to anyone. Only the response matters. And Clinton, by the way, didn't when NAFTA was brought up or the TPP, she didn't answer Trump's queries there. She flubbed those issues as badly as Trump did on his tax returns. 
It's just that Trump has a tendency to ramble, and therefore he digs himself a hole on these issues, whereas Clinton simply dismisses them and refuses to respond, pretends that it was never said in the first place. Word on the street is that neither of these are particularly good approaches to such an issue, but that it ultimately doesn't matter that they flub them because nobody cares. Now, with the polling. Why would there be a discrepancy between CNN's single snap poll, which is literally the only scientific poll that we've seen cited by any mainstream media outlet, and all of the online polls? The first thing people point out is, oh, it's rigging. It's rigging. Uh, people use, like, bots or people, you know, voted multiple times. Well, why would, why would Trump's fans be so much more energized, so much more tech literate, and so much more numerous? Because one of these things at least has to be true then clinton's fans in a tied race have you thought have you stopped to think of this look at the florida early voting if you want to know the truth if you look at early voting within florida trump had a lead in early voting tallies of a hundred thousand votes this is the first time that a republican number one has beaten the democrat in early voting in the state of florida it's a historic landmark, and it doesn't bode well for Clinton's campaign. What this suggests to me is that there is an enormous amount of additional Trump support. This is what Scott Adams has posited for some time. I didn't go out on a limb and posit this because it seemed speculative. There was no way to test it. There was no way to infer that this was likely to be the case beyond a handful of open primary states uh, where Trump indeed did get a lot of extra leverage. I think that there is a substantial proportion of the population claiming to either back Clinton or be apolitical and not intend to vote at all or pretending to back a third party that actually back Trump but aren't willing to admit it. And that would account for the extra votes he got in Florida where, by the way, when early voting was happening, he was behind. He was behind Clinton in Florida when this early voting was happening, and yet he gets 100,000 extra votes. He's ahead by about four or five points in that state, which is roughly commensurate with what the polls show now. With Trump normalizing himself, humanizing himself perhaps, including making fun of himself, he had to have known that his temperament comment uh, would not actually be taken seriously, including by his own fans. He had to have known that. And bicker all day over whether Clinton has the right temperament for the office as well. But there's, there's no illusion in anybody's mind that Trump doesn't occasionally go ape shit. He doesn't occasionally fuck himself by saying something that eh, seems a little bit odd. But on that comment, I think he meant what he said. It was very measured. It was very cautious. You could see him thinking about what he was saying. He knew what he was saying. It, it was all by design. When I look at the polls, when I look at the online polls and I see that Trump wins the debate in, in all of those, but loses the snap poll, I say first and foremost, CNN helpfully admitted that they oversampled Democrats by about 10 points, undersampled Republicans by a similar margin, and therefore, yeah, that, that makes up most of the difference in that poll. If you fix for that, I would assume Trump would be about even with Clinton. Now, people pointed out undecided voters <clears throat> and what they said. And they said, oh, well, they favored Clinton, too. That's not entirely clear. What about the peer pressure effect? They're taking part in a public snap poll. It's not anonymous and online where they can just go on and vote. What I think you're seeing, rather than rigging, for the most part, I think any rigging by Trump fans with a botnet or whatever would be uh, certainly negated by the fact that I would assume that Clinton's fans, if they're energized at all, would do the same thing. That leaves two possibilities. Either Trump's support really is higher, and those polls online reflect reality, and the snap poll reflects people don't want to admit that they actually like Trump. Or, number two, Trump's fans are far, far more energized. Clinton's fans can't even be bothered to vote on an online poll, much less go to the polls in November, perhaps, where they actually have to get up off their ass to do so. If that's the case, the election has already been won, and Trump will be the next president. And this latter point does coincide. If we assume that there's simply much higher energy and much more general approval by core supporters of the candidate, which happens to be Trump. If we assume that, and it is an assumption, there's no way to prove this, 
then it would at least explain the early voting in Florida. Why would Trump, somebody who at the time was behind in a state in most of the polls, suddenly shoot ahead by 100,000 votes in early voting, which already, the early voting tally, a lot more people were casting early votes. I, I expect turnout in the election as a whole to be much higher than the last few elections. It will be at least higher, a little bit higher, probably, than 2008. It'll be much higher than 2012. That was humdrumville. Nobody cared about that election. Romney versus Obama. Who gives a fuck? Does it really matter who wins? Obama versus McCain. Who really cares? Except Obama cast himself as, hey, I'm, I'm not the war candidate McCain is. That's why largely he won. I don't think, by the way, it had anything to do with him being black. People talk, the Republicans ranted and raved. Oh, well, a lot of people voted for him just because he was black. I voted for Obama in 2008. I learned my lesson in 2012, voted for Ron Paul. I couldn't bring myself to vote for Magic Underwear Romney. I voted for Ron Paul, the true Republican nominee of that year. The one that probably would have beaten Obama if the Republican Party weren't so stupid. The Republican Party thereafter was so dumb, and one reason why I like Trump is he's crushing the Republican establishment too. If, if you think that I've suddenly become a rock-ribbed Republican, like an Evangelocon or something, you're completely wrong. Trump attacked them with almost greater vigor than he's attacking the Democrats right now. And I appreciate that. I, I don't have a problem with that. I'm not a partisan. You have to understand that. I'm also not a partisan libertarian. I'm a libertarian in my views, but I'm not a partisan member of the Libertarian Party. That's why I abandoned Johnson. And because Johnson has strayed so far from the platform, he's barely a libertarian at all at this point. No, when I look at the polls, when I look at the online polls and I see Trump is up by anywhere from 2 to 40 points, I discount the outliers. I, I Drudge, yeah, anyone using Drudge, they probably are a Republican. I'm not too concerned about that result. That echoes the, uh, the primary debates. But there is something else to be said. After almost all, I think there was one debate during the Republican primaries that Trump appeared to carry according to the more scientific side of polling. In every other debate, people thought he came off as rude, he came off as pig-headed, he came off as not knowing what he was talking about, and he came off as somebody who is temperamentally unfit, which is a Clinton line that she's been echoing over and over, which apparently hasn't worked, after every single debate during the primaries. The mainstream media continuously declared that Cruz and Rubio and sometimes Jeb were the ones that were the most sensible, were the ones on the stage that had a better presence, they had better things to say, perhaps a little bit more prosaic in their delivery. Whereas Trump beat around the bush, avoided questions, skipped one debate altogether out of uh, apparent spite to the RNC. And yet, over and over again, the online polls taken after these debates, with the exception of the debate Trump wasn't at, showed that he handily won. That's because substance doesn't matter. Truth doesn't matter. What, the, what these people are saying up on stage, does anybody take it seriously? Do you actually think that Hillary Clinton, for instance, is going to reconsider the TPP when she glowingly praised it for years? She won't. She'll sign it on day one if she's elected. Does anybody actually believe that Trump is immediately going to lay the groundwork for a border wall and that what he's saying isn't some permutation of we're going to enact a tariff on a country that's enacted a tariff on us and because of that extra money we'll have the money we need to eventually build a wall? Does anybody actually believe anything that these people are saying for a moment? I, ho I hope you're not because if you look throughout the past, especially in recent elections, Politicians simply say what they need to get elected, and this is where Trump's comments about black voters really come into, into use regarding the Democrats manipulating them. I think that's going to be more effective than you think. Uh, I gauge that as being uh, extremely effective, actually, to point that out. He's the, only, he's the only Republican in modern time that bothered to point it out. It might, it might work, honestly, with some segments of this population of the United States. You look at what Obama said, for instance, when he was campaigning. Sounded really good. Oh, well, no, I don't think we need to expend more manpower overseas. You know, then he wants to uh, bomb Assad. 
He oversees the overthrow of Gaddafi with the no-fly zone there. He applauds the fact that Egypt's falling apart and so forth. He, he obviously is not a peacenik as he presented himself. Oh, I'll close Gitmo. Well, he didn't. I had somebody the other day. I pointed out that Trump was fundamentally correct when you listen to him say that Clinton's been in office for decades. He uses the figure of 30 years or 26 years. Depends on what you consider in office. Is it an an official position or does her time as first lady count? It doesn't really matter. She's been in there for a large number of years and hasn't really done anything to address the issues. She hasn't pushed any of the issues that she's now talking about. Whereas Trump, not having been in politics, of course, different story. It's more difficult for people to discount his campaign promises, I suppose, at least mentally. I discount them because, yeah, if he's elected, he becomes a politician. He's still a politician. Not one right now, but would become one. Clinton, of course, it's easy to say, yeah, she's been in office for decades. Never once has she pushed, oh, yeah, we're going to have free education. Oh, yeah, we're going to move to uh, something closer to single payer. She was never on the forefront of gay rights. She doesn't care about women's rights. It's it, She's got a long track record of defaming women who say anything bad about her husband. So I don't take this seriously, and I hope you don't. This isn't just with Democrats. It's with Republicans, too. So substance no longer matters to anyone. In fact, it shouldn't matter. It's not, it's not a bad thing that people aren't paying attention to substance in this election. I will point out something else that I think people haven't spoken of. And I'm getting a uh, yeah, spam call. I don't care. I don't even like cell phones, honestly. Uh, I will point something else out. There are five successive epochs within American politics. And they're driven completely by whatever kind of information transference is used in each successive epoch. The first epoch is just newsprint. There was no TV, there was no radio, there certainly wasn't any internet or social media or anything like that. The transference of information was largely local, it was very, very slow. Getting foreign news required literally that a ship be sent across the Atlantic Ocean. It was very, very slow. It was also more boring. You didn't have grandstanding politics in the newsprint era because it was impossible for grandstanding politics truly to exist. It isn't until the time of the telegraph, and certainly later, really, uh, the telegraph era, I suppose you could consider it a mini-epoch, but not really. Uh, It still required a lot more effort and was much more sporadic. The next epoch really begins with radio. And with radio, you're hearing the politicians voice, potentially. You're not just reading about what they said, as reported by somebody, you know, some newspaper editor, who probably has bias. You're actually hearing them, themselves, say something. It brings about a whole new epoch. Suddenly, the ability of a politician to speak, as opposed to what they say, the substance formerly mattered more. It's what they say, not how they say it. They simply say it, the press reports on it, everybody spins it one way or the other. Ultimately, the better idea tends to prevail. With radio, it suddenly became important that a politician be able to speak well. This, this uh, was something that apparently vexed Teddy Roosevelt to some extent uh, during his time there because he didn't like the way his voice sounded. We have a, there are old wax recordings of Theodore Roosevelt. Now, personally, I think he soars with delivery. Uh, however, you've got to realize he recorded these professionally, not actually delivering a speech at the time, but had notes to read from. So perhaps uh, we get a little bit of a different opinion of old Teddy there as far as his speaking skills. No question, though, one of our greatest presidents. Suddenly, we enter the era of television. Now, this comes basically at the end of Dwight Eisenhower. He's the first president, I believe, to be broadcast in color uh, live. And it becomes important subsequently with JFK versus Nixon. Now, Nixon was favored at the time. But when he got up on the debate stage on television, he looked gaunt and sunken with pancake makeup. He was nervous because he wasn't used to it. JFK, meanwhile, was younger. He was used to the TV thing. He was comfortable. That's why he won. He did just fine. The TV era continues for some decades. It becomes more and more prevalent. Then TV begins to die because the internet comes around. Now, there are two waves of internet epoch here. The internet age, 
which is until fairly recently and now the social media age. The internet as originally intended a couple decades ago was not instant for the most part. It was just a conglomeration mostly of websites. It isn't until you get IRC, which is really primitive, that there's anything really that instant there at all other than email. It's not a very effective mode of transferring information, certainly not to many people at one time. You can build a website, tag the website, blah, 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 and present what you want to say, but people have to actively search for it. As opposed to social media, which is the age we're in now, which starts roughly sort of in the last election, but now it's out of its infancy. Now it's a wild toddler that can no longer be constrained. Social media politics is instant. Fact-checking is instant. Memetics is instant. Everything is instant. When I speak here on YouTube, in a very, very short period of time, I can reach thousands or tens of thousands of people. I couldn't do that on the Internet as it was 10 years ago. It would have been impossible to do so. There wouldn't have been uh, a substantially developed, for instance, YouTube. There wouldn't have been a substantially developed Facebook. Twitter didn't exist. Mon many of these sites didn't exist or were in their infancy. They were in a form that's not remotely the same as what they are now. You would have barely had the rudiments of, for instance, uh, 4chan or something like that. And so things have changed. People's perception is all that matters. In the first epoch, it's all substance. Nobody's actually, unless you're actually physically there where the candidate happens to be, you're not hearing them speak. You don't actually see them. You haven't even seen a picture of them. You might have seen a sketch of them. That's about all. Up until the era of the telegraph. Then all of a sudden, things get a little faster, but it's still all substance. You're still not hearing anybody through a telegraph machine. You're still not seeing a picture of them. You're just getting that information a little more quickly. That's why I sort of discount it as an epoch. In the era of radio, it is instant, and you can hear the person, but you still can't see them. In TV era, you can finally see the person. Appearance now matters. It's not just what they say. It's not just their delivery, the way they speak. It's now their personal appearance as well. In the Internet... It depends on your ability to additionally captivate specifically those kinds of people that actually are interested in putting things on the internet and controlling the flow of it. But it isn't until the social media generation that there's, and that's basically the last few years, it's a new epoch in American politics. A politician no longer has any substantial need for substance. They don't have to worry too much about the way they speak. They do need to worry about their appearance to some degree. That's a holdover from the legacy media era of television. But mostly, they simply need to engage in the kind of rhetoric that allows seven-second quips or little video clips or something like that to be spread around at a greater rate. That's all that you need. It's become the celebrity election. Now, which one of the candidates is known for their more bombastic tone for captivating and, in many ways, manipulating the media into covering them and so forth. It's Trump. It's not Clinton. She's a holdover from the TV era. The, the Clintonian era is sort of the last gasp of the TV-driven uh, elections that we've had, sort of the first uh, Clinton. Then you get Drudge on board, and that really begins the Internet era. It's really all about Drudge in the latter days of Clinton through the Bush administration and probably, you know, a, few, a, a year into Obama's second term. That's the Internet era. Those are the Internet presidents. Whoever wins this election becomes the first social media president. Who do you think fits that description to a greater degree? And it's that, above perhaps almost anything else, that's why I give Trump the advantage in this election. Because it's a paradigm shift. In fact, it's overlapped with a second paradigm shift. It's a demographic shift. The Rust Belt is turning red. The Mid-Atlantic is going blue. The Southwest is becoming red now. Places like New Mexico are in play. Uh, the, I think the next shift in electoral politics will be that the coasts become more blue, with the exception of Florida, uh, perhaps in the Carolinas. The coasts will get more blue, the, the Pacific Coast and the Northeast. The Rust Belt will begin to turn red. Florida will begin to become more of a red state. I imagine that the next big bellwether is Pennsylvania. 
because it's on the crux between the urban, more coastal side of the state and the more rust belt proportion of the state. I think that Pennsylvania is going to go back to being the bellwether that it once was in the past um, for another time. And that's my prediction anyway. Uh, we can see how that works out over the next roughly eight years, uh, certainly. But in this election, there's no question in my mind that Trump has a massive advantage. He's either got much more energized fans, which accounts for everything we're seeing, and they're just blowing Clinton's fans out of the water, or he simply has more support and a lot of people don't want to admit that they support Trump. Now, when I wasn't supporting Trump, I didn't fall into this category. I was genuinely a Gary Johnson supporter until it became clear he had abandoned libertarianism. And I'm not a hard Trump supporter by any means. I'm a soft supporter of Trump. My decision, in theory, is still malleable. The problem is, Johnson's no longer viable for me, Jill Stein never was, and neither was Clinton. It's essentially between bothering to support Trump or staying home for me, because there's no other candidate that I can really bring myself to support. I can't support Hillary Clinton. It's impossible. I can't vote for somebody who wants to take more of my money and squander it, who has shown herself to be unable to even use a BlackBerry properly. I just can't do it. I guess I'm too young and tech literate to appreciate what she represents, which is an aging old woman who pretends to be cool, who is a, a TV media legacy holdover in the social media era. I can't do it. It doesn't even have anything to do with policy. Most of her policies are going to end up overlapping with Trump. They're going to listen to their advisors and they'll end up merging on a lot of issues. I don't support gun control. I honestly do believe that Trump is better on this issue. Uh, I think it'd be a terrible idea to expand gun control. I think it would drive the crime rate up. I don't believe in political correctness, uh, although I have no reason to believe that if the right gets into power, they won't just do what they did under W, which is now that they're the dominant force, they'll do the same thing, uh, and they'll try to go after you know various groups that tend to lean left, just as the left did. The left abandoned all common sense the second they got into power, and I, I call them the left loosely, because Obama's not a leftist. Clinton's not a leftist. They're simply partisans. Their ideology is centrism, essentially, centrist statism. And that's all it is. Globalism and interventionism, that's what they support. They're not actually progressives. They're not actually anything like socialists. When the Republicans used to call Bill Clinton uh, a socialist or a liberal, it was very, very funny because he was essentially just a Reaganite who happened to be younger and have a D after his name. It's the only difference. His policies were the same. Clinton's policies were the same as Reagan's policies or Herbert Walker Bush's. There's a reason why Herbert Walker has endorsed Hillary Clinton, by the way. Uh, they're Reaganite holdovers. They're, they're literally center TV era holdovers within politics cluttering up the system. I expect that they're going to get completely decimated either this election or next. Incumbents will be forced out. Some of them will die because, let's face it, many of them are in their 70s at this point. A lot of them won't be with us by the next election. Uh, they will get purged and replaced by the internet and post-internet social media generation of political thought. And this will function better for a time, but let's not kid ourselves. Just as newsprints supplanted by telegraph, supplanted by radio, supplanted by TV, supplanted by early internet, supplanted by social media driven internet, something else will come along. I don't know, maybe holographic internet or something like that, full immersion internet, AI internet, something like that will come along and upset the apple cart again. But we now have a double paradigm shift Social media election paradigm shift, the sixth epoch of American politics, technically, or fifth epoch if you don't count telegraph, uh, and a paradigm shift in voter preference, especially in the Rust Belt, with another paradigm shift, which would have been Clinton making inroads into the Deep South, blocked because Trump's support there happened to be Newt Gingrich levels of high. And by successfully doing that, I think he wins the election. So when people rant about the polls being rigged, ask yourself this. So you're saying that Hillary Clinton's supporters are simply less energized because they're supposedly as numerous as Trump supporters. They're simply less tech literate and thus potentially younger, or they're less energized, they just don't have the wherewithal to do the same thing that Trump fans are doing. Well, that's quite telling. You should be worried for your candidate if you think that that's the case, because this is the social media generation. It's not the TV era anymore. 
The mainstream media on TV doesn't matter. Not even one little bit. Nobody trusts them. Nobody cares about them. That's about all. Peace.